we start with a crappy CGI puddle being walked over by a crappy CGI rat. As a man in a red leather gimp suit hugs a cross on top of the local church. Apparently, his name is Matt Murdock, aka Daredevil. And inside, the local priest lends some help to the injured kinky fella, before we zoom into his cataracts and transition into a flashback to when he was a kid with working eyes but kept getting bullied in alleys all the time. Turns out Matt's dad is a boxer, who tells his boy that gossip about him being a naughty criminal and totally working for the local mob boss are just hurty rumours, bro, and promises his son that he's totally on the up and up. And poor little Matthew just can't believe it when he stumbles on his daddy shaking down a civilian for money. And he's so upset that he stumbles into a random chemical waste factory and promptly gets blinded because reasons. When he wakes up though, all he can see are blue blurs, what occur whenever anything makes a noise around him, which I guess are supposed to represent vibrational frequencies. What's <sighs> some shit? And according to the movie, his heightened sense of sound gives off a sort of radar sense. So naturally, he then spends years training his mind and body by doing dangerous handstands on the edges of buildings and stuff. Anyway, after smacking up those mean kids who were so mean that they still felt it was okay to bully a cripple, the mob boss tells Matty's boxer dad that he totally better throw his next fight or else. But said boxer dad don't really want to look like a pussy old melt in front of his now disabled kid. So he totally wins a fight and then probably gets pummeled to death out back in the alley with a giant black shadow leaving only a single rose behind at the scene. And though he might have become a boy without fear, he's certainly not a boy without fucking anger issues now, because he swears total vengeance on that random black shadow which has killed his bent daddy. Anyway, after taking literally 20 minutes of runtime to recount his tragic backstory, the movie then returns us to Matt Murdock all grown up. And these days, he's now a fancy lawyer who's out here listening to people's bodily functions without their consent in order to detect their lies. And later tells his best mate Foggy Nelson, who's played here by that happy Hogan fella from the proper Marvel films, that he can't believe that they totally failed in their one freaking job. And now the bloke what raped their client is going to be back on the streets to do some more raping. Before Matt threatens to go full Dexter and dish out some of his own direct brand of justice. So he then throws on his edgy gimp clobber and grabs his kinky toys, before then smacking up a bar full of goons to the soundtrack of an edgy Nickelback tune. Gah, he's just so damn edgy. Anyway, after he's done splashing about in a small puddle for a bit, he finally catches up to that naughty rapist what just got off scot free for rape because Matt and his mate Foggy are such crap lawyers. And the hero whose one weakness is loud noises thinks it's a totally smart decision to follow the bad guy down to the fucking subway. So naturally, said bad guy almost blows his noggin off when an innocent train passes by and totally disorientates him. But luckily, he manages to regain his senses just in the nick of time before knocking the creep onto the tracks and bravely letting him die. Gah, what a hero. Then we meet a journalist called Yurik, who really wants to find this daredevilly fella, and proves to the local cop that the mysterious do-gooder totally exists by lighting up his emblem on the floor. Because clearly, the edgy vigilante had nothing better to do than leave a preposterously impractical calling card. Kind of like that Dark Knight fella did in his own film that one time. Anyway, Matt then goes home and soon winds via voiceover about losing faith and hope about being able to make a difference. And even that local priest reckons he's going a bit too far by stalking the streets in the dead of night whilst dressed up like a reject from a pride rally. Bruh. The next day, he gets a raging lob on when he smells a gorgeous girl coming into his local cafe and probably tries to get her name and number. But she don't give her stuff that he's blind and says she's totally not going to give up the goods so easy just because he's played the disability card. So shut up about it already. But because he's been spending too much time around literal rapists in recent nights, he don't want to take no for an answer. And so totally follows her about before getting all handsy. But in a shocking twist, what this male chauvinist casual misogynist could literally never see coming. 
She don't really like being molested in broad daylight by strange men what can't even see. So naturally, they have a full-on fist fight in the middle of a kiddie's playground. Though no one seems to really care about a supposedly blind geezer setting such a great example by beating up a small woman by the swings. Kia, good job he ain't got the benefits of his following him about and trying to see if he's faking it or not. <coughs> Elsewhere, we meet a giant chocolate baldy bloke called Wilson Fisk. And his business partner, called Nick Nachios, reckons people are totally starting to figure out that he's the kingpin of crime what's doing all these bad things in town. So Nicky Boy wants his boss to buy him out so he doesn't get dragged down with him. But the chocolate fatty don't want to do no stinking deal and instead passively aggressively threatens his daughter. Oh shit, not good. So after getting smacked up by a girl in a small playground, Matt casually brushes off how he was able to do lots of flips despite claiming he has worse vision than Bud Light's marketing department. And so she says her name is Electra Nachios, which is Greek apparently, and that she's totally studied fighting stuff since she was five years old, isn't she? Meanwhile, Fisk says that he's totally going to frame that Nachios fella as the kingpin, and then asks his goon to send for someone called Bullseye, who's busy lobbing darts at a literal bullseye at the local pub before throwing a bunch of stretched out paper clips into a guy's neck and bringing a whole new meaning to having a sore throat. So whilst he's off killing a yapping old lady on a plane by stuffing his nuts down her throat, it's just steady. Daredevil is busy patrolling the city and soon stops a thug what seems to be scared of his own shadow. But turns out it's not his own shadow, but in fact fucking Batman. Whoops, I mean Shrek. I mean daredevil. And after stopping said thug doing a bunch of bad things, he realises that he's accidentally traumatised a nearby little boy. And so then stands on a random rooftop telling himself that he ain't the bad guy. Despite this literal vigilante bloke just committing GBH and also letting a guy get run over by a fucking train earlier. The next day, he gets an invitation to a fancy ball from that electric bird given her daddy totally owns a hotel he's being hosted at. And said Electra Bird starts stalking him now. And so naturally, he takes her up to the roof to try and stick it on her. Mainly by complimenting her necklace and asking if it comes in braille. Because he totally wants one too. And after she starts to get a raging lady boner by being romanced on top of a small roof. He tells her that if she just spends a little more time with him alone up there. Then she's going to get soaking wet. And before you can say, Kinky. It totally starts to rain. Which now means that he can somehow see the vague outline of her pretty face by the power of blue sparkles. <sighs> or some shit. But before he can fully finish knocking her face off, he hears someone in trouble. So he's totally got to head off and save it. Or maybe he's just making excuses because it's just been raining so there must be some fresh puddles to jump about in and stuff. Later, Matt and the foggy fella attend the fancy ball and soon bump into that journo Yurik, who then bumps into Matt and knocks his stick over. Then they come face to face with that big baldy chocolatey fella, who they proceed to insult to his fucking face by claiming that they can't represent him in his cases because they only handle clients what are totally innocent. But he just says, no, but he's innocent bro, and he didn't want their stinking services anyway, especially when they couldn't even put away an obviously guilty and creepy seedy rapist earlier. Then he has a dance with that cheesy Greeky bird, what's weirdly named after my favourite Mexican snacks. As Kingpin plants a single rose into her daddy's chest pocket and properly says his goodbyes. Which soon starts ringing alarm bells for this fella. Especially when a baldy Irish assassin starts chasing them on a motorbike and lobbing throwing stars at their drivers. Damn! But luckily, that crimson gimp turns up and totally makes said baldy assassin miss a shot for the first time in his life which totally hurts his ego. And so naturally, they have a piss poor CGI fight before the crafty bullseye bugger nicks his little stick and lobs it into the chest of Daddy Nacho. Electra then wakes up thinking her pappy just got yeeted by a sex gimp and soon swears bloody vengeance on the devil of Mel's pigeon. Hell's kitchen. Matt then trashes his room like an emo teenage girl throwing a straw before then lurking at his girlfriend's dad's funeral to the soundtrack of teenage emo music. Tears, 
And after Amy Lee is done crooning about her immortal and she, that Uric fella pays a visit to a chunky Kevin Smith, who rather unfortunately isn't playing Silent Bob in this flick, as Silent Kevin Smith is usually the best Kevin Smith in my book. But anyway, he shows him Daredevil's weapon what they totally recovered from the chest of Nicky Nachos. And Yurik totally recognises it as the walking stick of that blind lawyer guy from the fancy ball earlier that evening. Elsewhere, Kingpin congratulates Bullseye on completing the hit job. But he says he's heading out to finish off that gimp boy, because he was well out of order making him look like a right mug by dodging his shots and stuff. And knowing he's now the devil of Hell's Kitchen, Yurik warns Matt that Kingpin doesn't just eat one person when he goes after him, but instead their whole entire family and so hints for him to keep an eye on that electrifying top totty nachos bird. Speaking of, said electrifying top totty nachos bird is busy smacking up innocent sandbags to the second Evanescence song in under 10 minutes. Gah! No wonder these fuckers have only made three albums since this movie came out 20 years ago. Because they're probably still living off the royalties from this movie alone, to be fair. Anyway. Electra then confronts the kinky guy who she reckons penetrated her daddy with his stiff and solid stick. But this daredevil fella tries to scapegoat poor old Agent 47 by saying it was actually a bald hitman what killed her father. So chill the fuck out, bro. But she just calls him a liar and totally stabs him in the shoulder. So he totally reveals his secret identity. And she just can't believe her horny fuck buddy was the one what did all these bad things. But luckily, said baldy hitman appears and confirms it was actually him. Before impaling her hand with one of her own spear things. Nice. But hilariously, she just shakes it off. Before immediately going back to doing fancy spinny tricks. Despite there being no way in hell she would even be able to close her fist after such an injury. But turns out the Greeks are no match for the Irish, and she soon gets herself stabbed up before then dying in Matt's arms. Aww. We then return to the present day, and revealing that everything we just sat through was still part of the opening flashback. Really? But Bullseye soon follows him back to the church, before proceeding to engage in yet another dodgy CGI fight scene. And after Double D dodges blades of glass by the power of slow-mo backflips, Bullseye soon incapacitates him with loud noises, before doing a bit of monologuing and then revealing that Fisk was the kingpin all along. And worse, he was also the giant black shadow fella what killed his boxer daddy back in the day. Daredevil then gets super pissed, and after ruining his enemy's hands and thereby neutering his power set, his vanquished enemy then begs for mercy like a right pussy -o. And so naturally, our God-fearing heroic protagonist chucks the defeated fella out a giant fuck off window. Oh, that's cold. The chocolate kingpin then faces off with that red velvety cream puff, who's promptly thrown around the room like fresh meat on a casting couch. And it looks like it's curtains for the man without fear what loves splashing around in small puddles. Well, that is until he sets off the sprinkler system and once again unleashes the power of blue sparkles and then crippling the big boss by sliding through his legs and sucker thumping the geezer. Oh, that's gonna hurt! Anyway, after bringing a black man to his knees while saying he's been dreaming about this day since he was 12, um, he instead spares his life, and soon confirms that he's not the bad guy after all, despite already letting the man get flattened by a train, and literally just having chucked a surrendering bald Irish fella out of a church window. Daredevil then tells his defeated foe that everyone knows that he's the kingpin crime boss now. But Fiskface just scoffs and says he's totally going to tell everyone that Matt Murdock likes to dress up in tight leather every night and wrestle strange men in dark alleyways. But Matt reckons he don't really care. And if Fisk ever escapes jail, then he'll totally be waiting for him with his stiff and solid stick. And we end with Matt finding Electra's necklace hanging in that playground where they had their first day, what involved gratuitous violence though this time it's indeed in braille, and implying that she's somehow still alive and she, and thereby restoring Matt's faith, as journalist Yurik also decides not to expose Matt's true identity in Evening Kings. And that's it, that's the movie. And as this is technically a kind of Marvel flick, there's even an end credit scene, 
Although it doesn't really tease any future films, and to be fair, if you wanted to see Colin Farrell do weird things in bed, then you'd be better off just watching that infamous sex tape what he released around the same time. But anyway, that's a blot and that has a lot. Considering in that mail thing, so you don't miss any future recaps. Tell me if you like this flick in the comments, if you have time. And I'll see you in the next one.